dancing goes on. Okay, I think I'm good. <laughs> Greetings, brothers and sisters. In this video, I'm excited to share an interaction from the Ottawa March for Life in May 2024. This was my inaugural participation in this profoundly impactful event, which often stirs considerable political debate here in Ottawa, Canada. Our nation's leaders tend to overlook the critical issue of the unborn, leading to some of the most permissive abortion laws globally. At the event, my pastor, Pastor Scott from Christ Church in Hawkesbury, and Pastor Luke from Smiths Falls, took to the streets of downtown Ottawa to boldly proclaim the gospel. We engaged in several enriching conversations captured on my body camera. I apologize for the camera angle and hope to refine this in future recordings. Stay tuned as I plan to upload more of these conversations soon. In this scene, we need a bit of context. My pastor, Pastor Scott, was engaged in open air preaching and I was nearby acting somewhat like an undercover street preacher. My strategy was to observe and approach individuals who seemed engaged with what Pastor Scott was saying, as it's often easier to start a conversation with someone already showing interest. During this session, a group of women dressed in purple, whom I'll refer to as the Purple Nuns for simplicity, passed by. It's unclear if they were actually nuns, but their attire suggested a religious affiliation. If anyone watching knows why they were dressed in purple, please share in the comments. One of these women, who I'll call the Purple Nun, broke away from her group and approached Pastor Scott after listening to him for a while. She offered him a gospel tract. I don't want to presume her motives, but it seemed she might have disapproved of his message given the context of our later conversation, which I'll upload next. Seizing the moment, I approached her to inquire about the tract she was distributing. I was eager to understand her perspective and engage in a meaningful dialogue. The whole world and the The Bible says the times of ignorance God overlooks. That means he's been patient with us. So we keep talking about his name. I'm just wondering if you can tell me what you think the purpose of life is. The purpose of life? Yeah. When I engage in evangelism, I often begin by asking people for their opinions on the meaning of life as a conversation starter why this approach experience has taught me that directly inviting someone to hear the gospel often leads to rejection however taking a cue from the apostle paul acts 17 16 34 who skillfully engaged with skeptics in greece by challenging their philosophies i've found that people are generally more comfortable discussing their views on life's purpose even if they haven't fully formed, formed their own beliefs. This method opens up the dialogue in a more natural and inviting way, setting the stage for deeper conversations. God created life, so the purpose of life is uh, to find our way to eternal life. To serve, to serve God? Well, uh, maybe here on earth to follow his commandments. I apologize for the camera angle in the video. A better angle might have captured her facial expressions, providing more context about how quickly the conversation unfolded. She was making several expressions indicating a desire to disengage from our discussion, clearly not thrilled to be in conversation with me. What's, 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 what's that? Just so are, you, are you like a Christian or are you? My goal here was to keep the conversation going as long as possible while steering it back towards God. It's always revealing when individuals who claim to be Christian seem reluctant to discuss God or Christianity. Although she does admit to being a Christian, you'll soon see that this claim is very much in question. Like a, like a, a Roman Catholic or 
what you are, eh? How about you? I'm, I'm a, uh, what you would call a Protestant, I guess a Protestant, right? A Protestant? You believe in God? I believe in the triune God, yeah. Uh, yes, I do. Okay. Now, I I know with 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 Protestants and Catholics, we're we're going to agree on on the tr Trinity. It's it's more so really the um, how we're saved. That's a bit of an issue. Uh, well, we're saved through Jesus Christ. So this is where the conversation takes a fascinating turn. After establishing our mutual belief in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I begin to delve into the crucial topic of salvation and explore who is truly responsible for it. We, we are, but, but, but you would say that we would, we would be saved through the works that we can do. Not necessarily. There are works. Of course, we all have to work for something. Right. But, but it's but, not just about works. Well, but, but, but I'm talking Sometimes about Sometimes our works is just our own prayer life or our duty as a family man or... Whatever so that would be like like a, like a work, right? Like you. Like I mean, following the commandments. That's work too. Yes, but but, we, but how would we do that? Like, like it's because you know you know about Genesis three, the fall, right? Like my aim is to help her understand the inherent sinfulness of humanity, and our inability as fallen beings to save ourselves or even approach God on our own. How like mankind fell into all like, like sin, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. We, we fell into sin. So um, God says that n no one wants God. Nobody wants to come to God. So how would we... As stated in Romans 3, no one seeks God on their own. She challenged this by asking, who says that nobody wants to come to God? Who says nobody wants to come to God? Uh, uh, Paul in Romans 3. Okay, it, it's, in, it's in all circumstances that uh, uh, no one, no one wants to seek for him. No one even wants to, no one even wants to come with us. See? Well, especially these days. There is... She suggests that circumstances are the reason why people might be deterred from coming to God, yet she believes that individuals can still choose to come to God of their own free will, or as I like to clarify, without a change in nature or disposition. No one righteous, not even one. There is not even one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers well, is on he's their lips. He's talking about a certain group. He's talking, about, he's talking about all of mankind. It don't matter. Did you catch that? She says, don't matter. He's talking about all of mankind. It don't matter. I will push back on that, arguing that it very much does matter. Well, it does I'm, matter. I'm not going to analyze that particular verse. Why not? Because... I believe this serves as a clear example of the fundamental differences between those who uphold God's word as his true words and those who claim to believe in him, yet, when challenged, place human authority above what God has explicitly stated. Acknowledging the word of God as the ultimate authority is crucial, and it distinctly separates true believers from those who merely identify as Christian. While I am not singling out Catholics, I genuinely admire their fervor on the abortion issue, particularly in the Ottawa area where Catholics are often more visible in pro-life activities than Protestants. However, it's problematic when anyone claiming to be Christian dismisses the significance of God's word. Some may think I'm being too harsh, but as Vadi Bausham puts it, I didn't write the mail, I'm just delivering it. Do you, do you believe that the, the Word of God is... there are so many different verses that a person can go in and nitpick and analyze to death oh, no, and not, not get... But, and not but, get. but, but we're, not, we're not nitpicking, we're just reading it in context, right? Anyways, like, like, anyways but you're right. A lot of people these days not, don't want to seek God. I say everybody doesn't want to seek God. It, it, what has to happen is God has to change your heart. John 3.3 3, ESV, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God change your disposition for you to want to seek after God. You can't earn it yourself. The Purple Nun countered the scriptures with a profound assertion stating, one must first possess the desire to change. No, you yeah. have to want it and then he'll it's, change your well, heart. How, would, how would you work with, uh, with John 3? Because Nicodemus asked you know Jesus what? that too. At this point, the Purple Nun became very uncomfortable and wanted to end the conversation. I'm not going to nitpick at the nitpick. Well, you should. You should want way. to. Because like, cause, like it's, 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 aren't we here to serve 
Christ? Aren't we here to serve God? I'm here. Like, you're giving up tracts, right? Yeah, and that's that's biblical too. Uh, so you're willing to defend this? Do you, do, you, do you want to go through this? Do you have time to go through this? Because uh, this is the gospel, right? This is your well, gospel, right? Maybe later. I've got a whole bunch to give out, so maybe we'll talk about it. Okay, well, I appreciate you talking to me. I wish we could have focused more on the topic of grace. However, as you saw, once she was presented with biblical scripture, she had no place to rely on. It's unfortunate because the gospel that this Catholic nun was handing out had almost nothing about Jesus Christ on its pages. In fact, I wish we could have gone over it together because it would have been beneficial to discuss the idolatrous prayer to Mary mentioned within its pages. Let me quote directly from the pamphlet. O Mary, O most pure dove, how many are now in hell on account of this vice? Sovereign Lady, obtain for us the grace to always have recourse to Thee in our temptations, and to always invoke Thee, saying, Mary, Mary, help us. Amen. This prayer is steeped in idolatry, and it leaves me feeling as though I should wash my own mouth out with soap. Isaiah was indeed right when he spoke of us as a people with unclean lips. The notion that Mary has any role in grace, salvation, or hell is utterly beyond my comprehension. Scripture does not support the concept of a heavenly mother. The closest reference is found in Jeremiah, where God expresses his anger towards such idolatry. Jeremiah 7.18 ESV The children gather wood, the fathers kindle fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the Queen of Heaven, and they pour out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. Furthermore, the idea that Mary could be sovereign is not only a gross misinterpretation, but also ventures into dangerous theological territory. To attribute sovereignty to Mary, as if she could influence one's salvation, is to misunderstand her role entirely. Mary, revered as the mother of Jesus, is herself a beneficiary of grace, saved not by her own deeds, but by the atoning sacrifice of Christ on the cross. It is crucial to understand that Mary is not part of the Trinity. She possesses no divine power to save. Prayers directed to her as if she could intercede from a position of sovereignty not only lack biblical foundation, but also drift into idolatry. The focus should always return to Christ, our Lord and Savior, the central figure of our faith and the only mediator between God and man. Before the purple nun parted ways, we had one more brief exchange. I'll upload that video likely next week, where I'll delve into the controversial points she raised regarding my line of questioning. Here's a hint. It relates to Genesis 38. Thank you again for watching, and as always, if you can subscribe and like our videos, it would be immensely helpful in overcoming the YouTube algorithms. God bless.